1987. With prayers for the safety of the workers, construction of Kansai International Airport began. The first task was to strengthen the soft ocean floor clay so it could support the airport's immense weight. To strengthen the seabed, engineers used a well-tested method known as sand draining. Specially designed ships floated above the construction site, first spreading a one and a half meter layer of sand over the ocean floor, then hammering one million pipes deep into the clay. It's a fully automated process controlled by shipboard computers. Next, enormous barges equipped with pile drivers forced sand into each pipe. Finally, the computer-controlled ships pull out each pipe, leaving a million columns of sand. When the finished airport pressed down on the waterlogged clay, its weight squeezed the water from the clay into the sand piles, draining it, thus making it harder. But the sand drains could not reach the deeper diluvial clay. Nothing could be done to stabilize that. With sand drains in place, work on the sea wall began. To keep waves from washing away its rubble slope, seawall workers had to armor its surface with massive stones. 18 meters below the surface, divers guided these armor stones into position. The divers were veterans of many underwater construction projects, but none as deep and as far from shore as Kansai Airport. They faced deadly hazards in the turbulent ocean depths. At this place, we set stones that are about one or two tons each in the water. It was far from the shore, so there were bigger waves. It was a challenge for us. We did it, even in tough situations like in bad weather. One guy had his leg amputated at the thigh because the waves moved the stone and it smashed into his leg. We were always close to death, in a way. Despite the dangers, work on the seawall continued as workers maneuvered 69 gigantic steel chambers into place. Each of these mammoth casings was 23 meters high, 23 meters in diameter, and weighed over 200 tons. Pile drivers pounded them into the ocean floor to form the corners of the sea wall. Workers placed 48,000 four-pointed concrete blocks along the sea wall's south and western edges, where the sea was strongest. These strange-looking blocks are designed to dissipate the force of breaking waves. By June 1989, two and a half years after work began, the sea wall was finished. Now, the airport builders had to find enough soil to fill it. On the mainland, crews worked round the clock, excavating three entire mountains. Huge barges transported the excavated soil to the airport site. For three years, a fleet of 80 ships dumped earth inside the sea wall until it rose over 30 meters above the ocean floor. Global positioning systems directed each barge through its onboard computers, telling it exactly where to dump each load. The island fill combined three different sizes of coarse rock and gravel. Engineers hoped this mixture would resist liquefaction in an earthquake. Slowly, the airport island emerged from the sea, despite anti-construction protests as violent as those at Narita Airport. In the autumn of 1987, giant floating cranes brought the first pre-assembled bridge pier to Osaka Bay, anchoring it on pilings driven into the seabed. By the spring of 1989, 29 of these piers stood in line between the airport island and the mainland. The gigantic cranes returned with enormous steel modules, each over 150 meters long and weighing over 4,000 tons. Bolted together, they formed a double-decked truss bridge over three kilometers long, 
one third longer than the Golden Gate Bridge, with a price tag of over a billion dollars. Its upper deck was a motorway, its lower deck a railway. Flexible joints connected the expanse so that the giant bridge would bend, not break, in a typhoon's deadly winds. By March 1990, the bridge was built and the airport island was nearly complete. This man-made island was created by the effort, sweat, blood and tears of over 10,000 people who worked very hard. On Kansai Airport's island, construction firms started preparations for the monumental task of building the passenger terminal. But in March, engineers made an alarming discovery which threatened to destroy the project. Kansai Airport was sinking into the sea. Airport officials had expected the island to settle some six meters into the soft seabed. But by March 1990, it had sunk 8.2 meters and was still sinking five centimeters every month. No one knew when or if the sinking would stop. No one knows uh, exactly to, you know, what to do because it's quite a far, uh, different from our past experience. It's big size and a very heavy load. These two factors combined give rise the uh, effect of waking up the sleeping lion. <laughs> the revelation stunned Osaka and the nation. The international press dubbed Kansai Japan's sinking airport. Some compared it to one of history's most notorious engineering blunders, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. After 20 years of planning, three years of construction and billions of dollars, it appeared that Kansai Airport might never be built. What had seemed genius now appeared to be merely hubris. As public outrage grew, the president of Kansai Airport resigned. Engineers scrambled to find a solution, if there was one. We cannot stop the compression of this type of soil, because we can cope with the soil with various new techniques, down to 50 or 60 meter depth. But now the soil in the question is 200 meter deep. So we cannot apply any sort of artificial technique to them. To keep the airport above sea level, workers piled an extra three and a half meters of soil atop the island at a cost of $150 million. They dropped a 20-ton weight 30 meters onto the runway to compact its soil. They decided to pave the runway with asphalt because asphalt would absorb earth movements better than concrete. Yet, their greatest problem remained unsolved. It was time to construct Kansai International's passenger terminal. But how could they build it on a sinking island? While engineers debated, the terminal's architects perfected its design. Noriaki Okabe had spent 25 years in Europe working with world-renowned Italian architect Renzo Piano. Together, they had created some of the world's most remarkable buildings, including the famed Pompidou Center in Paris. But at Kansai, they faced the challenge of their careers. The Kansai terminal had to be small enough to fit on a man-made island, yet big enough to house all the complex functions of a modern international airport. High enough to inspire passengers with its beauty, yet low enough to allow air traffic controllers an unrestricted view of every aeroplane on the tarmac. It seemed an architectural paradox. 
Architects usually get stimulated by looking at the site before the work starts. This project was unique because there was no site yet. There was no ground. Seeking new sources of inspiration, the architects turned to the structures of nature. Nature's natural geometry solved their most difficult problem, how to make the terminal both high and low. The answer lay in the toroid, the remarkable versatile shape of magnetic fields, convection currents, bicycle tires, doughnuts, and fruits. The enormous Kansai terminal is only the small visible portion of an immense toroid, over 32 kilometers in diameter, circling through the earth. The toroid shape allows the building's center to soar 26 meters high, while its wings taper to 6 meters, inspiring visitors, giving the control tower a clear view, and making architectural history. It is the most pervasive form in the natural world, Toro. And so far as I know, this was the first time it had been used, certainly the first time it had been used in a big structure. Since Kansai was designed, the toroid has become a very fashionable form, particularly architects working with British engineers who have mastered how to use this form. But uh, it was innovatory at its time. By the spring of 1990, an international team of architects and engineers had created a cutting-edge design for Kansai Airport's passenger terminal. The blueprints were ready, but the terminal could not be built until the builders solved a puzzling problem. The completed terminal would weigh only half as much as the vast amount of earth excavated for its foundation from an island that was sinking into the sea. The lighter terminal would not sink as fast as the heavier island. As island and terminal pulled apart, the massive structure was certain to crack. The problem is not that the building is sinking into the ground, but that the ground is sinking faster than the building. People don't realize, but the building actually floats in the earth. That's one of the reasons they have to have basements. They're like ships. Um, and that's particularly true of New Earth. So Kansai Airport has a ballast of a quarter of a million tons of very dense iron ore in it. As they prepared to build the terminal, engineers lined its foundation with a two-and-a-half-meter-thick layer of crushed iron ore, hoping the extra weight would help the terminal sink as fast as the island. On the 24th of April 1991, terminal construction began. It would take nearly three years to complete. Following the architect's blueprints, workers erect some 30 steel trusses to support the roof. Each of these massive trusses weighs over 200 tons. Then, workers assembled the terminal's skeleton of 250 ribs, each forged in the United Kingdom and carried by ship to Japan. They installed nearly 5,000 panels of glass on its sweeping front, carefully encasing each panel in a rubber frame so it will move, not break, if an earthquake or a typhoon sways the building. They cover the roof with 90,000 stainless steel tiles tested to withstand fierce typhoon winds and violent seismic shaking. With painstaking effort, workers lay each of these tiles individually by hand. High ocean winds make their task even more difficult and sometimes impossible. By 1993, the terminal's enormous shape rose above the airport island. Over a million architects, engineers and workers around the world had contributed to its construction. Today, Noriaki Okabe wanders with pride through a superstructure, widely proclaimed as one of the most brilliantly designed airport terminals in the world.
a very big building, Kansai. It's possibly the longest building in history that is not a factory, but one huge room occupied by people. But what's very striking is the very intimate relationship it sets up between you, the person moving through, and the building that is making way for you, leading you through, guiding you through. This is a very extraordinary sense to get in what's a highly technological, enormous building. I think that's one of its most extraordinary achievements. Arriving by car, rail or hydrofoil, passengers enter what the architects call the canyon, a vast open space over 30 meters high and 300 meters long. Four cavernous stories linked by humming escalators and whirring elevators, designed to impress but also to inform. The reason why this space is so huge is so that people can see where they are going. Any spaces in a structure can be seen from wherever you are. As they move beyond the canyon, passengers don't have to navigate a sprawling multi-terminal complex as in many other airports. Domestic and international arrivals and departures are vertically stacked on the four floors of the terminal building. Passengers travel up and down a central set of escalators, which carries them to arriving and departing flights. Finally, they emerge into the terminal's spectacular departures area, a kind of aviation cathedral nearly two kilometers long, making Kansai Terminal the longest building in the world. Automated trains whisk passengers to its 41 aircraft gates. Travel time from the central terminal to the end of each wing is only 90 seconds. An ingenious system solves a baffling problem. How do you air condition the world's longest building? If you uh, blow a big air jet into a very large space, uh, it travels so far now what we did on Kansai, which I think is quite innovative, was to create a shape of ceiling which was similar to a, an air jet shape and to stick the jet to the ceiling. If you make a jet of air stick to the ceiling then it travels up to twice as far as it would if it was in free space and it will cause a much bigger circulation current. Gigantic yet graceful 18 nozzles send air flowing along the ceiling into sheets of smooth fabric which keep it circulating. Colourful mobiles reveal the moving air. It's the first time it had been done at such a big scale and it's the first time in which the shape of the roof and structure was exactly shaped to the decelerating air jet. It's the building that is most in step with what is happening in the sciences and must herald the future. But when it was finished, Kansai Terminal's future remained in doubt as the island beneath it continued to sink. Even with its iron ore ballast, the terminal would almost certainly crack as the heavier island beneath it sank. Engineers devised a surprisingly simple solution. In the basement, 900 concrete columns support the building's massive weight, but that's not all they do. As the terminal sinks, sensors on the columns alert computers in the central control room. Technicians scan the computer screens, looking for trouble spots. This screen shows the current subsidence of the terminal building. The areas in red have less subsidence and those in blue have more. When the computers warn that the sinking island threatens to crack the terminal, workers raise or lower the columns in the endangered area to keep it level with the ground. They use powerful hydraulic jacks which can move columns up to 38 centimeters if necessary. 
Workers slide iron plates under the jacked up pillars to hold them up after the jacks have been removed. It's no different from sliding a beer mat under the leg of a wobbly table. But Kansai Terminal has 900 legs and weighs nearly 3 million tons. It's a solution which, as I understand it, has been used before in Japan and it might seem a bit primitive, but I have no reason to suspect that it's anything but perfect for the problem. In fact, everything in the Kansai Terminal's basement is designed to move up and down. Air conditioning and other systems are bolted to the ceiling instead of the floor. Doorways feature several centimeters of extra room overhead. In their zeal to save the Kansai Terminal, engineers try to think of everything. This terminal building has been adjusted at all times. I'm on the stairs which connect the first floor and the basement. The step why I'm standing right now was the height of the floor when the airport opened. In the last four years, we jacked it up three times, and as a result, we added two more steps here. Measures like these helped the airport cope with its sinking island. But they also delayed its completion by over a year. John Discovery Channel. On September the 4th, 1994, Kansai International Airport finally opened for business. The Emperor's son, Crown Prince Naruhito, and his wife, Princess Masako, attended the opening ceremonies. 11,000 police stood guard in case anti-airport protesters attacked. As they celebrated, the airport's proud builders could not know that nature's fury would soon assault their masterpiece. Dawn, the 17th of January, 1995. Kansai International Airport had been open just 15 months. It was a day no one would forget. At 5.46 a.m., a devastating 7.2 earthquake rocked the Kansai region. The massive tremor was the deadliest quake to strike Japan since the Great Tokyo Earthquake of 1923. I was still in bed because it was quite early in the morning. It was a very big, upthrusting movement. Dishes fell out of the cupboard in my house. I had never experienced an earthquake like that before. Hardest hit was the city of Kobe. The city's wharf was raised over three meters, cranes toppled, and a harbor breakwater sank. Railway lines and major motorways buckled. The earthquake killed more than 5,000 people and injured over 25,000. More than 300,000 people lost their homes. Kansai International Airport was only 29 kilometers from the epicenter. When the earthquake hit, the first thing I thought about was my family. Then I thought about Kansai Airport. Maybe all the glass was broken. Fearing the worst, officials rushed to the airport. Outside the terminal they found a cracked pavement, but few other signs of damage. I raced to the airport in my car and arrived before 7 o'clock. When I rushed into this control room, all the machines were operating properly. The airport had survived one of nature's deadliest assaults. Or had it? With so much devastation nearby, it seemed too good to be true. 
When I came to Kansai Airport, we could see Kobe was burning. Although you couldn't see anything wrong, I had great anxiety about the airport's invisible parts. The inspections confirmed that the airport's anti-earthquake measures had worked. Engineers had used a mixture of large rocks to build the airport island. When the earthquake hit, this coarser landfill absorbed the shaking. Had the fill rocks been smaller, the island's soil might have liquefied. Airport buildings would have collapsed as so many other structures did. Instead, the delicate looking passenger terminal proved as tough as its architects had hoped, thanks to its ingenious design. For example, at this bridge, that side of the building is fixed, and this side has a sliding system to absorb the shock. At the time of the Kobe earthquake, this point moved 10 centimeters. Even the terminal's massive glass walls were intact. It was important not to transmit the movement of a roof in an earthquake to the glass wall below. We designed a system which absorbed all movements between the two structures by using sliding or rotating joints. During the Kobe earthquake, this system worked so well that not a single pane of glass was broken. Kansai International remained open throughout the crisis, serving as a staging area for arriving rescue teams and supplies. The building was, in fact, the building closest to the epicenter of the earthquake that destroyed Kobe. That doesn't mean to say it was hardest hit, because the buildings in Kobe were equally hard hit hard. But because it had been designed to cope with all these things, it rode it out with any, without any damage at all. Surviving the Kobe earthquake was a triumph for Kansai's engineers. The airport had passed a significant test of its engineering and design. Three years later, it faced another as nature struck again. On the 22nd of September 1998, a powerful typhoon slammed into the Japanese coast, killing 10 people and injuring more than 200. Winds measuring over 200 kilometers per hour roared across Osaka Bay, whipping up dangerous slashing rain. By noon, the storm's full fury reached Kansai Airport. The typhoon had increased speed to the point of where we were arriving at the same time, and we did have quite strong winds. But uh, the difficult part was the people who tried to park us on the ground to keep them from getting blown away, literally. Uh, right after we landed, in fact, the airport authority closed the airport because of the, the difficulty on the causeway between the mainland and the island. Uh, it became unusable for vehicular traffic. When we were crossing the causeway going to the mainland, uh, there was a motorcycle who went down, and I, there, there was a couple of accidents that we had seen, so it was smart of them to discontinue. By evening, the typhoon had passed and Kansai Airport resumed normal operations. The terminal's roof had suffered minor damage, but airport officials felt lucky. The typhoon might have threatened the sinking island, now standing only five meters above sea level. Kansai's ingenious jacking system keeps the terminal building level, but it cannot stop the island from sinking Every year, the airport sinks over 30 centimeters deeper into the sea. Scientists debate how much more the island will sink, but some believe that if it keeps sinking, a typhoon's waves will someday swamp the airport. Next countermeasure is how to prevent the invasion of water. We are going to start with this sort of countermeasure maybe five or ten years time from now. If the top elevation of the Mamed Island goes going down, 
beyond some special value. In high tide time or typhoon time, it's quite easy to see water to flush inside the island. That's our greatest concern at the moment. Airplane cannot land in the pond, <laughs> so, <laughs> so runway must be dry all the time. To keep out storms, engineers must build a higher sea wall around the airport. But this isn't the only challenge. If Kansai Airport is to survive economically, it must expand. Since it opened in 1994, its volume of international flights has nearly doubled. Its single runway can handle 160,000 takeoffs and landings a year. By the year 2007, it will reach that number. Without a second runway, Kansai will choke on its own traffic. The airport plans to build a second runway and a terminal on a parallel island, connected to the original airport. But the new island must be built in water even deeper than the first. The seabed is even softer. Scientists believe the second island could sink even farther than the first. At the new site, we have to construct the island on a bad, soft foundation. Since it is impossible to do away with subsidence, we are thinking of constructing a second terminal building between the old and the new islands, which will float on the sea like a ship. Then we won't have to worry about it settling at all. But sinking isn't the only obstacle to expanding Kansai International. Combating the subsidence problem drove the airport's price tag to $15 billion, 40% over budget. Interest alone on the airport's debt is $560 million a year. Building a second runway will cost an estimated $14 billion more. Even if it never sinks beneath the waves, Kansai International may be crushed by the burden of its debt. There are many safety advantages to having a second runway, but primarily it's an economic necessity. Hong Kong and Singapore now have new state-of-the-art airports. Tokyo's Narita is building a second runway to hold its own in the highly competitive world of Asian aviation, Kansai has to expand. Engineers need the second island as much as airport officials do. They want to build higher sea walls to keep typhoons from someday swamping the first island. To build those walls, they must temporarily close the original runway. Yet, the immense cost of saving the airport, added to its already huge debt, may cripple its future. Kansai International Airport may never fulfill its builder's dream of becoming one of Asia's leading aviation hubs. But somehow, it's not Kansai's troubles most people remember. It's Kansai's achievement. Its landmark design has won the praise of critics the world over and earned the approval of the thousands of awestruck travelers who pass through it each year. I think it will be some time before what has been achieved there will be fully understood. The lessons will be learnt probably in the 21st century more than in the next few years from Kansai. People will understand more deeply what has been achieved there. Whatever its future holds, Kansai International Airport will always be a monument to a bold vision. A vision that dared to accomplish something no one had ever tried before. A vision that quite literally moved mountains, created land in the midst of the sea, and graced Japan with one of the world's most beautiful airports.